Hey there. In this video, we're going to talk about how to solve some things that aren't quadratic with some quadratic techniques by using something called a substitution. So I'm going to show you exactly what that's about. When you're asked to do it, typically it's something that is factorable in its nature, but just doesn't look like it right away. So we're going to talk about how to make a very simple substitution so that we can make something that's not quadratic into something that is, so that we can normally factor it and then go backwards to find out the appropriate number solutions for whatever polynomial we're dealing with. So let's get right to it. So when you're asked to solve something that's not quadratic, or maybe it is, but it's really wrapped up kind of funny, one thing that we do to make things a little bit easier is do something called a substitution. What we're looking for, we're looking for a piece of our function when we set it equal to zero that is the same in the first term and the second term. In the first term, we want that piece to be raised to the second power, and the, the middle term, the second term, we want it to be raised to the first power. And if that's the case, our substitution is going to work. Let's take a look at the first example. We're going to go right to it. So here's how to approach a problem like this. If we're supposed to find x-intercepts or solve this for roots or zeros, the first thing we do, like always, is we're going to set this equal to zero. Now, maybe our first like inclination is to distribute everything. Like, yeah, I got a mad distribute. You could, but it's gonna take a lot longer to do that. Here's what we are looking for and when a substitution will work. If we can write this on one side and have a term that's being raised to the second power and some term that has a first power or a factor, I guess is more appropriate, and we can have the same exact expression in some sort of parentheses, like 3x plus 4 and 3x plus 4. This is what I want you to look for. I want you to look at the middle term, make sure that we have the same thing here and here. This raised to the first power in the middle term, same thing raised to the second power in the first term. This right here tells you what your substitution is. If we substitute, call this little piece in both of these expressions, both of these, uh, these, these terms, Call them something else, like typically we use u, but it doesn't really matter. As long as it's some variable you don't already have, we want to use something that's not x. We're going to typically use u. Um, that kind of prepares you for doing something called a u sub when you get to, to calculus 2. Um, and and we, we can do that. We call it just a little, little u and we substitute and then all of a sudden we get back to it later. And that's what we're going to do here. We're going to call a piece of this u. Uh, we're going to make it into a quadratic that's easy to deal with, with stuff that we already know. We're going to solve it, and then we're going to go back into the terms of x. So this is kind of like, like breadcrumbs. So if you've ever heard the story of Hansel and Gretel, I never did personally. So here's how Hansel and Gretel works. Hansel and Gretel works, in my head at least, that you call something you. And you go, all right, let's call 3x plus 4u. This is like your breadcrumbs. So the way that I was explaining Hansel and Gretel is Hansel and Gretel go in the forest, they leave a trail of breadcrumbs, they do some cool stuff, and they follow the trail of breadcrumbs out because they're still there. I mean, that's, that's the way that works, right? So, but th this is our trail of breadcrumbs. We're going to use u to get away from 3x plus 4. So you go, well, what, what do you mean by that? Well, if this is 3x plus 4 and this is 3x plus 4, which is why they have to be the same, I can call both of these expressions u some sort of variable that I make up. Then instead of 3x plus 4 squared, we have u squared. We'd still have a minus, we'd still have a 6, but then we could also call this u. And we still have a plus 9, and we still have an equals 0. And here's the reason why I told you two things. And you can see it now, it was a little bit vague before, because you, you really can't see it until I, we get to right here. The reason why we need these two pieces to be the same in order for a substitution to change into a quadratic to work is so that we can put the same variable both here and here. We need them both to be the same so the same variable works in both spots. We need this to be raised to the first power and this to be raised to the second power so that we can change it into a quadratic of our standard form u, oh yeah, that thing, squared, u, oh yeah, that thing, to the first power. This creates a quadratic for us. Like 99% of the time, this is going to be factorable. If it's not factorable, it is quite hard to deal with because you'll use the quadratic formula or the square root method. Um, and then we, we, if we have radicals in there, it's very difficult to get back to our original variables, or at least it's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of weird looking. So most of them are factorable. This one is... Yeah. 
And we know that we can use a shortcut, divide by our a, it's already simplified, and this gives us two factors, and they're actually exactly the same. We get, and here's one of the major mistakes I, I see students make. They go, oh yeah, let's factor it, great, I'm used to this. Uh, this is x minus three and x minus three. And this is the one problem with our substitution. If we change from x's into u's, man, u is your variable. That, that is what you're dealing with right now. It's a very common mistake. You probably have seen people make this mistake if you've been checking work with, of anybody else. Uh, th this is gonna happen sometimes because we're so used to dealing with x's. You go, oh, I'm done. I just set uh, this equal to zero, x is three. It, it's not. And if you plug in three up here, it is not gonna work. Uh, what happens is that we have we have to get back to to our x's at some point, but for right now, we're still in the variable u. We haven't used our breadcrumbs to get back out of this u forest for right now. So when we get here, we gotta be really, really conscious of the fact that we're still dealing with the variable of u. So this u squared minus six u plus nine, it does factor, but it's u minus three. And u minus three equals zero. And yeah, we can write this as u minus three squared. It doesn't really matter. Because what happens now is we're gonna solve this. We got this in like on, we got this equal to zero. We have everything on one side. We have a setup where we have the same exact expression, one being squared, one of the first power. We do a substitution to get the same piece called a different variable. It is a quadratic because we made sure that this exponent was two. This one is one, it forms a quadratic for us, something that's fairly easy to factor, and then we solve that in terms of u. So if u minus three equals zero, then u equals positive three. Now, we're not done. Our variable that we start with is in terms of x, and if we want to find x-intercepts, you haven't done that. We found what a u-intercept, we found a u-intercept for this function, sure, but this is not the original. So just like we used a substitution to get away from x's into u, we're gonna use the same exact substitution to get away from u's and back in, into x's. So that's why I said it's like a trail of breadcrumbs. You leave the breadcrumbs on the ground, you go do something and you come back, but you eventually have to use it to get back out of what you just traveled into. We traveled into u land when we made the substitution. Now we're gonna tra travel back into x land by using it again. So u equals three, great, great. But in the back of our head, we know that u really means this. So if u equals three, then three x plus four also equals three. This is one of those times when we're only gonna get one solution even though we have a power two because we have a perfect square trinomial. We have a double root, a multiplicity two root, we're gonna talk, talk about that in a few videos, uh, that we're gonna get the same exact solution twice. If we subtract four, and divide by three, we get x equals negative one third. If we check back here, no, it's not gonna work. If we check back here, yes, it actually is gonna work. So if we do that, if we check this, this should plug into this expression and give us zero and satisfy that equation. Let, let's try it. So negative one third is gonna be three times negative one third. Let's see, that's, that's negative one. Negative one plus four, that's three. Three squared would be nine. Plug it in here, we're still gonna get three, but six times three is 18. Nine minus 18, it's negative nine, plus nine gives us zero. We know that this is a solution and the only solution to this equation, and therefore this is a root zero x-intercept of this function. That's what we're doing. It's just one way to go about doing it. Uh, is it better than just distributing everything? Yeah, I think so, because we spent a lot of time doing that to get the same exact answer. So it's one way to sort of shortcut some other techniques and treat this as a very simple quadratic for the time being by using the substitution. Then, at the very end, once we've solved this in terms of that dummy variable, something you just pick, u or y or whatever that's not the variable of your function, we have to go back and solve it in terms of the variable you've been given. In general, we're gonna get whatever that exponent is, number of answers. Here we should have got two. Now we got the same thing twice because of that double root, um, but in general, that's what we're gonna get. So we're gonna move on to the next example. Dealing with f of x, we know this right off the bat, this is not a quadratic. We're gonna use the same idea though to make it into a quadratic with some other variable. This is a substitution technique. So if we're faced with this problem that says find x-intercepts, 
the first thing it wants you to realize is that we probably will have four, four, something, four solutions somehow. Now, some of them could be complex. If there's one of them, there's two of them. It could be too complex. There doesn't have to be. But in general, we're going to try to find that many solutions of our, of our polynomial. And so what we're going to do is we're going to set this equal to, to zero. And when we look at it, here's when to tell when a substitution is going to work. Look at your first exponent, look at your second exponent. If this exponent is two times this one, your substitution is going to work. The reason being, if this is two times this one, and we know that exponents raised to exponents is a multiplication concept. So x cubed to the fourth is x to the twelfth. Well, then if this exponent is two times this one, we can write the first term as the middle term raised to the second power. That's why we check. That's why we check to make sure that our exponents work in that fashion. So here's the idea one last time. We're going to look at this and say we want to find x-intercepts. Set it equal to zero. Then we check out our, our exponents. If it's not a straight up quadratic, maybe we can change it. Maybe we can look at it and go, hey, if that exponent for three terms is twice that exponent. I can write this as x squared. That, that looks really good. Leave that one. But then I can write the first one as x squared squared. Why? Because this is exactly 2 times this. That means I can write it as a square of whatever this middle term is. That's what we're doing. And this right here shows you what your substitution is. We know that we can replace this same thing. And yes, they have to be the same. You can't have two different expressions and call them the same variable. That's why we work so hard to make sure that these are exactly the same. We wrote this as the middle term raised to the second power because this is still x to the fourth, but it's represented as the same expression here. That is where we get our substitution. So our substitution is x squared. It looks pretty good. We're just going to call that u. So we did this. We said, hey, 2 times this one, no problem. That means I can write this term as this, uh, this factor, as this factor to the second power. Because if it multiplied by 2, we can basically divide that 2. And that becomes a power power 2 for us, x squared squared, still x to the fourth. Then we, we change it. You know, we're going to use that u equals x squared to do two things. Get us away from x's into u's. So this gets replaced by a u. This gets replaced by a u, not the 3, not the power 2, not the minus 2, not the minus 1. That's the first thing. And then later on, it's going to allow us to get back into x's. This should generally be something that you can factor. And this one is, is of course, factorable for us. We have this negative 2, we have this negative 3, we're trying to add to negative 2, multiply to negative 3. I'm seeing the negative 3 and 1. However you want to do that, whether you can do it in your head or whether you need a technique, factor by grouping, I've shown you that already. I, I don't really care. Um, I like the shortcut that I showed a while back. This right here tells you your factors. It also tells you your solutions. I know for a fact if I change those, those are going to be my solutions. So we're going to get u, not x, u. u equals 1 and u equals negative 1 third. If you want to do that right now, that's fine. We're really looking for efficiency at this point. I mean, we do want to show work because that helps us, uh, but efficiency is speed with accuracy, and that's what we're going for. We, want to, we don't want to spend a whole lot of time on things that we understand. Um, when you're learning them, yeah, but once we have this down, we know we should know factoring them really well, and we should understand that that's what we're going to get is, is something in terms of u. Well, we can do that. Now, if you want to go and show u minus 1, 3u plus 1, which is still true, 3u squared, plus u minus 3u minus 2u and minus 1. And then we set these equal to equal to 0. That's fine also. And we subtract 1, divide by 3, and simply add 1. We're so close. This is the last step that we need to do. So we've looked at this. we set this equal to 0. We've understood, hey, uh, this is three terms. That's going to make a nice quadratic for us. If the first exponent is two times the second one after these things are in order, we call this the same expression, same factor, one raised to the second power and one not. And this is the reason why we had to have a this times two is that. That's why we had to have that to write the first as a square of the second. 
Then we make our substitution, we factor something real nice, and now we gotta get back. So now that we're in terms of u, we don't wanna end there. We were given x's. So since we use this to get away from x's into u's, we're gonna use it to get away from u's back into x's. u is x squared, like this is in the back of our head. We know that that's true. So if u is one, but we also know that u is x squared, x squared equals one and x squared equals negative one third. And now we use some of the other techniques that we've already learned. So because we understand the square root method, we know that, hey, x squared equals one means that I can take a square root. And we practice it so much. If you take a square root, you need that plus and minus. So the square root of one is one, but we take positive and negative one. Those are two solutions. Now ask yourself, are those real solutions? Are those x-intercepts or not? Yeah, those are x-intercepts because they're real numbers. There's two of them, they're, they're distinct, they're not the same number twice. So these would be two actual x-intercepts of that quartic function, that's a power four. How they look, it might do this up, down, up, down, up thing. Uh, sometimes they just look like a, like a U, sort of like a parabola, but oftentimes they'll get this little dip in them. And so this is what this thing looks like. Uh, this is gonna be two crossings, one a negative one and one a positive one. Now let's check the other one. So x squared equals negative one third, and we go, all right, let's take the square root of both sides. So when we take the square root, and we do a plus and minus, oh man, we have dealt with the discriminant in the last video. We understand that if we have negatives inside of square roots, we have imaginary numbers, which means we have complex solutions. This is gonna give us x, and the right-hand side, that negative becomes i outside of our radical. Whether you rationalize or not, I don't really care, that's not the point right now. The point is to understand that this is not giving you more x-intercepts. What it does give you is, and this is without rationalizing, really what we should do is write this as one over the square root of three, multiplies by square root of three over, over square root of three, and end up getting Let's see, that'd be uh, i root three over three and negative i root three over three. That's fine, that, but that's not the point I'm trying to make right now. The point I'm trying to make is, is this. Number one, in general, you should get that many solutions, but not necessarily that many x-intercepts. So whatever the degree of your polynomial is, we should be able to factor that over complex numbers into that many solutions. And we've done that right now. We have that, we have four solutions. We have one, negative one, i root three over three, and negative i root three over three. We do need to understand that a negative inside of a square root gives us an imaginary number. So what this shows is that we have two real solutions, two x-intercepts, and we have two complex solutions, which don't give us x-intercepts. And that's pretty much it. So we're, we're finding out set equal to zero, make sure that the first term has a power twice the second term, then make it written as second term to the second power. Make your substitution, factor it, and then get out of it. So I, I, made, I made a comment just a while back about what if this doesn't factor? If this doesn't factor, we get things like this. I'm, I'm gonna make this up. This is coming from nowhere but my head right now. So let's say that we got let's say we got that as one of our u solutions. So we wrote this out, we made a, a substitution, it was a quadratic, we had to use the quadratic formula, and you had negative one plus and negative one minus square root of three over two. And let's say that u was originally x squared like we have in this example. But then we, we had this like, okay, use x squared, u is what we got here. We'd have to get back into x's. And the only reason why this is, is not fun to do is because you have square roots inside of square roots and it looks really awkward, but it's certainly possible. You may run into this from time to time. So if that's the case, notice you have another u, like that one, you do that same thing over here, and then you'd still use the square root method. You'd still take that on both sides. We'd get x equals plus and minus this really awkward radical, the square root of negative one plus square root of three over two. Just keep in mind that on this example, you will end up getting
when you do a plus and minus, potentially an imaginary number right here that's sort of hard to find. Because that's a, ne a minus 1 minus a square root of 3. Well, that's a negative number. That's like negative 2.7 over 2. Well, that's still a negative number. Square root of negative number. This is going to have an i in it. Uh, one way we can deal with this is to factor out a negative. Like this. Hey, there's a negative 1 minus a 3. Factor the negative then this becomes your i. And that would count for two solutions. Are they complex? Yes, they are, because they have an i in it. That would not be x-intercepts. This one over here, these are real numbers. Negative 1 plus square root of 3, which is like 1.73, that's going to give you 0.73. And then we just divide by 2. It's still a, a positive number instead of a square root, which means that you would get plus or minus Something awkward, but something approximatable and graphable on an x-axis. So I know that this was coming from nowhere. I don't have an example that would give you one of these right now, um, and I don't really want to go through it. Most of them are going to be factored. This is just if, if you run into a weird case where you've, you've done this and this is not factorable. You've done this and this is not factorable. Go right to the quadratic formula. You're going to get something that has these sort of solutions. Well, if you have the power x squared equals this, take a square root with a plus and minus, just watch out. One of these might be, doesn't have to be, but might be negatives instead of a square root. Factor out the negative, call it an i, and then you have two imaginary solutions. And one of them might be real solutions, which we have here. So this is a, um, this is a real number. It's a positive inside of a square root, and we have two of them. There's two x-intercepts. I hope that's making sense. Generally, we don't have to worry about this very often, but and the problem is, is that our textbooks don't give us that because they think it's too hard for us or something. Um, but I wanted to show you that that's possible. This is not a limited technique. It's a very powerful technique. It takes things that aren't quadratic, calls them something quadratic, figures it out, and then goes back into uh, the variable that we originally had. We can still do that here. And so maybe maybe use, maybe use practice that. So try to find something that, that isn't factorable that's a power 4 and a power 2. And do the quadratic. Get one of these solutions. Um, set x squared equals to it. Practice a square root with a plus and minus. Notice you still get 1, 2, 3, 4, three, four solutions. It's just two are imaginary. I hope that makes sense. I'm going to come back with uh, three more examples. We're going to go quite quickly through, and then we'll be done. All right, let's conquer the last three problems, just so we can be complete on the lesson. Make sure we're seeing some things that look kind of weird, and then how to get back into x's and solve the solve for that x. So that's what we're going to do. In every case, we notice there's three there's three terms. It's great. Went a little too far on that one. Uh, there's three terms. We're going to set each of them equal to zero to find x-intercept zeros roots, and we're going to go through the process of making a substitution, explain why that works, and then replacing a part of this e equation with u. Uh, figuring that out, solve for you, and then replacing it back with an x so that we can solve for the variable that's that's being questioned. So, number one, we're going to find x-intercepts and set our function equal to zero. Now, the only time a substitution is going to work for us in this context and make it into a quadratic is if this exponent, the first one, is two times the second exponent. And so we think about it. Is 2 thirds 2 times 1 third? Yes. And so how to make our substitutions is write these with the second expression, that second factor. Just write the first, fa the first term as that second factor to the second power. What I mean is if this is 2 times 1 third, then we can write this as x to the 1 third power squared. Because we know that when we take an exponent to an exponent, we multiply. That's why we always check to make sure this power is 2 times this one. It says you can take the this exponent and kind of break, break it down. Break it down into 1 third times 2. So this term itself becomes x to the 1 third to the second power. That gives us this middle term in this location, but raised to the second power. That's exactly what we're looking for. 
Also, I use those parentheses to show what I'm going to substitute for to make sure that, that I'm seeing that correctly. So I'm going to double check it just to make sure we're represent, representing the same thing and we're ready to substitute. So I'm looking at this thinking, I said equals zero. This is two times this one, no problem. That means I can write this as one third squared, the exponent one third to the second power. We've done that. Now I have the same exact factor inside my parentheses in both terms. That's great. And that shows what our substitution is. We always want to show what we're doing. So we always want to show that trail of breadcrumbs, if you will, that substitution so that we can go backwards and people who are following us know what we just did. So since we're calling x to the one third this variable u, we're going to have x to the one third? No, 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 we're going to write as u. Minus seven x to the one third? No, that's u. That's why they had to be the same, so we could call them the same variable. And now we're ready to factor. We can do this as quickly as possible. This is going to be uh, u minus 5 and, and u minus 2. We can do any sort of technique that, that works for your factoring at this point. So even from here, if we were, if we thought about it and wrote that down, we know that u would equal 5 and u would equal 2. And we're still in terms of u though. So we want to get back to x. We use the same substitution twice. We want to get away from x's into u's. Once we solve that, we get away from u's back into x's. So we know that since u equals x to the one third, that u equals five can be written as x to the one third equals five. and x to the one third equals two. Now here's the situation. A lot of students understand all this stuff, get down to here and they get stuck because we fail to realize what we're dealing with. So when we see x to the one third, man, what in the world? How, how would I solve that? How would I undo that? That exponent. There's a couple ways that I'd like you to think on it. The first way is this. Remember that anytime we have a fractional exponent, that this represents a radical. So this is a cube root of x to the first power. And I'm gonna do the second one in a different way. So the cube root of x to the third power, sorry, uh, cube root of x to the first power equals five. How, how do you undo a, a cube root? Well, same way with, that you've done with a square root, except with a different exponent. We'd say if we have a root three, a power three is gonna undo that. So that would be x would equal 125. And that's true because the cube root of 125 is 5. The other way we can look at this is by leaving it as a one-third power and understanding that you can do anything you want to as long as you do the same thing to both sides. In fact, we took both sides to a third power. Can't you do that here? If we did one third to the third, one third times three, we have, have an exponent raised to exponent. We're going to multiply those powers. One third times three is one. X to the first power equals eight. Either way you go, you're going to get precisely the same technique of solving. They're both raised to the third power. It just kind of depends on how you look at them. That's what we're doing. We're solving these is understanding what that really means and then undoing it. I hope that makes sense. I hope you understand the, the nature of, hey, whatever you have here is what you're going to use twice. One to substitute, one to substitute again to get back to your original variables. And that's what we have done. And both of those are actually solutions. Let's move on to the next one. Sometimes it looks a little awkward. You go, well, <laughs> say x wants at all. But based on what we just did, when we set this equal to zero, and we look at it and say, that's three terms, but I have no idea what to do with it. I don't want to start solving for square roots here because then I'm going to have x's on the other side. It's going to lead me down a pretty dark road. I don't want to do that. Instead, maybe we can do a substitution. If we think that, if we think about how radicals are actually exponents, and we understand that this is really x to the first power, and this is x to the, let's see, power over root. That's a power one over a square root, that'd be one half. 
then we can see that the first exponent is exactly two times the second one. So I'm gonna encourage you to write your radicals as those fractional exponents, rational exponents, so that we can see it pretty clearly. That's three terms, it's in order, it's one side, first term is positive, it's really good. And then we say, hey, you know what? That power is two times that one. If that's the case, I can write the first term as the second power squared because one half times two is still one. That's what makes this work. You say, hey, that's two times that. I can write it as one half squared, no problem. I'm still gonna write this in parentheses to show what I'm substituting. Say, hey, you know what? Now that you have the same exact thing in both of these terms, let's, make, let's call this u or some other variable. That way we get a u squared plus one u minus 20 equals zero. We're gonna factor that as quick as we can. Again, if it doesn't factor, you're using quadratic formula, you're gonna end with a sort of a nasty uh, u equals some sort of expression with radicals. But don't worry, you can still undo some of these. You just square both sides like we would here or cube both sides like we did, would here and you basically leave it. Um, the only problem that we've run into, and I'll talk about it here in just a little bit, is that when we start squaring negative numbers and making them positive, we run into some issues. So we'll look at that in a second. Uh, let's see, that would be negative 4, positive 5. That adds to 1, multiplies to negative 20. I'm going to go right to it. I know that u is going to equal positive 4, and u is, u is going to equal negative 5. If we plug that in, we can check it if we really need to. Uh, 16 plus 4 is 20, 20 minus 20 is 0. 25 minus 5, well that's 20 minus 20 is 0. We know those are solutions in terms of u. And now we got to go back to our x's. So because u is x to the 1 half, we need to really realize what x to the one-half power means. It is a square root. That's where it came from. And so maybe that's a little bit help, more helpful. Either way, I don't really care. But if we think about this square root of x equals 4, square root of x equals negative 5. Huh. Uh, how do we undo a square root? Well, a second power would undo a square root. Should we do that? Yeah, I think we should totally do that. Let's raise this to the second power, this to the second power. We should do one side, do the other. We get x equals 16, done. That's perfectly right. That's an x-intercept. That's where that function crosses the x-axis at x equals 16 comma zero. So the point, sorry, 16 comma zero. And we do the same thing, right? We go, all right, let's, let's square both sides. Let's square this. And we got uh, x equals positive 25 because negative five squared equals 25. And that's true but it's based on a false premise. It's based on the fact that you can get the square root of x to equal negative five, and you can't with real numbers. And so what this is, this is a non-solution for us as far as x-intercepts. This is a problem. So we run into this from time to time when we don't have polynomials. Um, some, some of the fundamental things that we deal with, like, hey, the exponent equals the number of roots, that, that works for polynomials, but not some of the square roots in A. And so we, we kind of fail some of that. So we only have one solution. This is a false solution. That is not true. You can't square both sides. We need to really be thinkers. We need to think that, hey, the square root of x can't equal negative 5. That, that, doesn't, that doesn't work for us. Um, we, have, we have to have, like, uh, I don't even think, we, we, can't, we can't do that for reals at all. And so that fails our finding real solution sort of idea that we're dealing with here for x-intercepts. So just be careful on that one. You can tell, right? It's, it's really easy for students just to square everything here, and that's what undoes a square root, and then you get 25, and your teacher goes, no. You go, why? Well, because a square root can't equal a negative, and that over real numbers, and that's, that's an issue. So I hope that makes sense. Um, what I was talking about a little while ago, imagine that you had something very awkward, I'm gonna deal with this one again. And imagine you said, oh yeah, u is x to the one half, or the square root of x. Because that's a little hard to, to visualize as a decimal, and it is. I mean, that's negative one minus negative uh, minus 1.73, that's negative 2.73 divided by two. So it's a little 
it's negative one point something. Uh, it's kind of hard to visualize. And so you can see that when people get into the process of solving these, it's very common for people to go, oh yeah, let's square this, square that, and then I get this whole thing squared, and then I'm good to go. No, because that still is a negative, and you uh, you have this square root of x equal to a negative number already. That's that's based on something that's false for real numbers, and so by squaring it, you can't get a real solution from something that's not even possible over real numbers. I, I, you I hope you're following me on that one, that this premise is false under real numbers. You can't have square root of x equals a negative anyway. Squaring it ain't gonna make it better. It's just you're based on something that's false and we can't allow that. So this is a problem to watch out for. So if you've done this and this is not factorable and you do quadratic formula, be very careful on solving for your x's when you undo that substitution. Be very careful on that one. I've given you now three examples on that. Here you won't have a problem. When you cube both sides, you can have a cube root equal to negative. Totally fine, doesn't even matter. Even if that's a negative, negative five, great, it'd be negative 125. Cube roots don't care. Cube roots are okay to have negatives. Even roots, not so much. Odd roots are just fine. And that's what I wanted you to see there. This happens so rarely, uh, but it does happen. I want you to be thinking about it. Thinking about it how, hey, look, that's a square root. That's a negative. That's a problem. Just like this would not give us a solution, neither would that one. Now, the other one, if this had been a plus, would have been fine. Negative 1 plus square root of 3, that's positive. Divided by 2, that's still positive. And then when we took that and squared it, that'd be okay. So if we would have had... this and say, hey, yeah, let's make the square root of x. That's fine. That's okay. That's something that's possible under real numbers. So the square root of x could potentially be this positive number. Square both sides. And that would be a valid solution. Just leave it just like that. That's fine. If you want to multiply, you certainly can, but that's probably the most concise that we're going to get it. So I hope you follow me. That you have to be very careful on substitution techniques. Number one is set them up right. Set them up, make sure you have the first term is an exponent two times the second one. You make a nice little substitution. Hopefully you factor it. If not, then you do quadratic formula and with solutions that look like these under your dummy variable like u. When you go back and resubstitute to get your x's, just be careful what you set those x's equal to. If it's outside the domain of what you can, or uh, sorry, outside the range of what you can get for your x function, then you have to exclude that. With cubics, there's no exclusions. It's fine. This cube root of x can equal any number, positive or negative. So you just go with it. Cube both sides, and you're good. But when we have things like square roots, uh, when we have things like fourth roots, sixth roots, um, things to the fourth power. If they equal negatives, that gives us problems. Uh, that gives us either imaginary numbers or things that aren't even possible at all. Um, so be careful with that. Just check your work very carefully. Understand what you are doing. That if we're trying to do things like squaring negatives, that's no go. This gives us no solution. If we're squaring positives, even if they look funny, that's okay and you get a solution there. So this quadratic would give us one solution from that. Uh, cubics, you'd, you'd still get two because we can have negatives inside of cube roots. That makes sense. Okay, the last example in just a second. So that one looks pretty nasty. Let's go ahead and handle it. See if we can find any x-intercepts for this. So we're going to start by setting this equal to zero like we do for all of our functions that we're trying to find zeros root your x-intercepts. And then we see what to do with it. Is everything on one side? Yes. Is the first term, is it in order? Uh, sort of. I mean, our exponents are negative, but sort of decreasing the absolute value. That's in order enough. And then, but secondly, is the first term positive? And the answer is no. So one thing we want, want to do all the time when we're trying to find x intercepts is make your first term positive. How we do that, factor out the negative, divide both by negative one, multiply both sides by negative one, change all the sides, understand they just change all the signs, or add and subtract everything to the other side of our equation. I'm gonna change all the signs right now. So let's say when we're multiplying both sides by negative one. What that's doing, even though this has a negative for our function, because these are finding x-intercepts, it doesn't really matter whether we reflect it or not. The x-intercepts themselves, or in this case, y-intercepts, that's the horizontal axis y though. 
the horizontal axis y though, would, they would not change. So let's let's multiply by negative one. Change the signs of all of our coefficients and constants. And now we look at it and go, that, that still doesn't look much better. That is nasty. What in the world are we going to do? Is it a quadratic? No, because polynomials, including quadratics, cannot have negative exponents. Can we do a substitution to make it quadratic? Yes. Anytime your first power is two times your second power of an in-order polynomial or expression in this case, we can make a substitution. So we will look at this and go, hey, that's negative two, that's negative one. Oh, hey, negative two is two times negative one. What that means is we can write this as the first term is the same as the second term, but raised to the second power. It's this to the second power, and that's exactly what we have. Negative one times two is still negative two. It represents the same thing, but we're trying to find this common piece that's the same with the first one raised to the second power, second one raised to the first power. That's going to model a quadratic when we do a substitution. So that's what we want. It fits what we've done before. And now we're going to substitute. We're going to say that u equals this inside in both of these terms. It's got to be the same. we got to use a different variable than we've been using. We're going to say it's not y to the negative 2. It's y to the negative 1 power. And then we're going to substitute. So 2u squared plus 11u minus 40, that's something that looks a whole lot nicer. It's something that hopefully is factable. If not, well, then we'd have to do quadratic formula right now. And I'm going to show you how that would look at the very end using my favorite, negative 1 minus square root of 3 over 2. I don't know why that's my favorite. Uh, but this is factorable. That doesn't look very factorable. You got 11, you got negative 80, because 2 times negative 40 is negative 80, you know, well, it, it's going to be, it's 16 and 5. So if we do negative 5 and 16, that adds to 11, that multiplies to negative 80. So what do we do? We either do factor by grouping, or you do another technique, or you use the shortcut thing I've done for you. And we say this is negative 5 over a. This is it's positive 16 over a. We've simplified where we had to and left them as fractions. This will read your factors to you, or it will tell you the opposite sign of your solutions in terms of u. So I know that u is going to equal positive 5s, and u is going to equal negative 8. We can find it here, too. This says 2u minus 5 for one factor. That says 1u plus 8 for the other. If you want to distribute and check your work, now is a great time to do that. 2u squared, let's see, plus 16 minus 5 is positive 11, so plus 11, and then minus 40. Set them both equal 0 by 0 point of property. And we're really close to done. The only thing we have to do is go back into the variable from where our function came. So this is kind of awkward because we had y's. This would be like a, a y horizontal axis and h of y. So something like a z or something, a vertical axis. So it's a little weird. We're finding y intercepts right now. So we have to put this back in terms of y. Use what you've done. So u is y to the negative 1 power. If u is 5 halves, then we can set y to the negative 1 power into on as equal to 5 halves. But then we got to realize what that means. Why did the negative 1 power, like having any negative exponent, creates a fraction on that factor? So y to the negative 1 power is the same thing as having 1 over y. Essentially, what that's telling you is that this is the reciprocal of the solution you want. So if you just need to reciprocate this to find the y, just reciprocate this one also to find the y. That's, that's fine. That's exactly what we're going to do. So we're going to reciprocate that fraction. So y is going to equal 2 fifths because 1 over y equals 5 halves. 
Same thing happens here. Don't change the sign though. So because this is one over y, if one over y equals negative eight, y itself equals negative one eight, the reciprocal of negative eight over one. And those are the two solutions we get. I hope that's making sense to you that we have the substitution should be make it should be kind of flowing well in your head right now that we're just making a quadratic. Hopefully we're factoring it and then we're undoing that substitution and solving for whatever variable you had already been given based on the substitution that you made. Now I did mention that I would talk about this. What if this had been something really awkward like we got um, like u equals that negative one plus square root of three over two, something like that. And, and, and another weird, weird solution for a substitution. Uh, I'm just gonna do one of them this time, but if you had y to the negative one power equals this, so you got to here, it was not factorable, you did quadratic formula, you got two nasty somethings, this being one of them, with something else uh, being the other one, and you realize that this is one over y. Well, if this is the reciprocal of what you want, then you can reciprocate both sides. The only problem with that is that that has a square root on the denominator, and if you have to simplify it, now you're starting to talk about uh, rationalizing denominators. You'd multiply by the conjugate, negative one minus square root of three, and you'd have to distribute. It's gonna kill off the square root on the denominator. Um, for me, I'd say that's fine. If we ever had to make it that far, you could still approximate that and get a decimal, something you could find a, a, a y-intercept in this case. Um, but if not, you'd have to rationalize that to get that square root off the denominator. The other one would just be a negative one minus square root of three over two. You'd do the same thing. Your conjugate would be negative one plus square root of three over two, and then you distribute. So again, you don't deal with that very often, but I want to make sure you understand that this technique is robust. It's not just, it is specific, right? It's specific in the, in the fact that you have to have three terms, and you have to have the first power two times the second power. You've got to make a substitution of the same thing in two terms. Then we hopefully factor, do another technique, get down to the variable that's your substitution variable, your dummy variable, and then we undo this whole trail of breadcrumbs by putting our x's back and solving it with whatever we need, like taking both sides of third power or a second power, watching out for negatives here, uh, having a reciprocal of our, our solution, and making sure that we need to rationalize if possible. So that's how to deal with that if we have the quadratic. But other than that, it's the same thing. I hope I've explained it well enough. Uh, we use this from time to time. To, uh, to make our lives a little bit easier and extend the concept of quadratic methods to things that aren't quadratic in the start. All right, we'll catch you for another video.